Good morning, everyone. I, um, I know you've been seeing these Path Ahead webinars from my bedroom that I grew up in in South Carolina, but I thought, well, you know, for the end here, I think I'll, I'll come outside and uh, share the azaleas blooming and the palmetto trees in the background um, that we are enjoying here in South Carolina. So today I'm looking at my screen and I see that I forgot to change the title. Dang it. Uh, today we are going to hear from um, Anaconda and we're going to hear about how they're um, uh, from Adam Vothier with the Anaconda Local Development Corporation and Gloria O'Rourke. They're going to share a very unique partnership and a very important recreation asset that they are working on in Anaconda um, to energize their economy and provide uh, access to uh, the great outdoors. So next slide. First, a little housekeeping. Uh, we'll keep the questions to the end. And in the, um, if, you, if you do have questions, you can include them in the chat bubble. You can also, if you have technical issues, uh, which I, I'm thinking we're probably all pretty familiar with Zoom these days, um, you can text your issue to 406-200-8240. Next slide. So the little background about this series, the Path Ahead webinar series, it's a collaboration between the Montana Office of Outdoor Recreation and Montana Access Project. The former director in that office, Rachel Schmidt and I uh, realized that that there was a, a lack of a place to tell these stories about the uh, front country recreation amenities, assets, challenges, challenges, opportunities that we have in Montana. Uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, back country. There's a lot of talk about quote public lands writ large, uh, but not a lot of talk about the hard work. Um, successes and sometimes failures that lead to successes that outdoor smaller communities go through uh, in rural places like rural Montana. So we put this series together to feature those, um, those stories, share lessons learned, create community, create connections, um, connect to the, to the outdoors. Uh, next. Today, the key takeaways, we'll, we'll learn how Anaconda's um, Washoe Park Trail, which is right in town, is a natural, uh, key natural asset for residents and visitors. We'll learn why the trail system, which connects front country to back country, and if any of you have, have been to Anaconda or been to the area, you know that the back country amenities that um, Anaconda is the gateway to are mind boggling and incredible, incredible, incredible assets. You also probably know that the community of Anaconda has been through decades of um, Superfund cleanup. So we're going to hear uh, about the silver lining, uh, half full instead of half empty. Um, how that Superfund process has um, led to more better trails and more better access to the outdoors. We'll also hear a little bit about how um, sometimes folks get antsy and anxious to put a trail on the ground um, and sometimes it works out and sometimes it creates a lot of headaches going down the road. So uh, in this series, we do tend to feature and, and um, encourage communities to plan first instead of build first uh, because it saves a lot of headaches and a lot of money down the road when it comes to, to building trails that are built to last. And finally, we're gonna hear about the very unique um, partnership that the Anaconda Community Foundation has with the Anaconda Trails, which really, really caught my eye. And I wanted to feature that, uh, that relationship here with these special guests. Next slide. Uh, briefly, I'm gonna allow, uh, have them introduce themselves and tell a little bit more about themselves uh, when 
they are up. But uh, we have uh, Adam Fothier, who's the director of the Anaconda Local Development Corporation, who became the executive director at age 32 and um, has some great stories to tell, both about how this trail system is, is um, ca came to be and is emerging and energizing into the next phase 2.0, uh, but also what he's seeing on the ground, as will Gloria talk about what they're seeing on the ground in communities like Anaconda in this COVID and post COVID economy, which is, much more nimble than it was, both in terms of businesses being able to locate in places that people want to live and people being able to work remotely so they can work where they want to live as well. Um, and we have Gloria O'Rourke, who we, has also already been a guest with us, um, who talked about their her uh, great work that they've done in the community of Shoto with the local community. In this episode, she will be wearing her Anaconda Community Foundation hat. Um, but as we all know, uh, many hats, many hands um, do, are needed to do good work in rural communities. Next slide. So the focus, um, what I like to do is I have these building blocks of, of successful, keys to success for outdoor recreation infrastructure and outdoor recreation assets good planning, good design and construction, funding, operations and maintenance partnerships. And the focus for, from this, for this episode will be really mainly around partnerships and also around design and construction. So uh, both on the, on the planning end, but also what it means uh, to actually design and construct a sustainable, long lasting trail and how important that is both financially uh, and especially for rural communities that rely heavily on volunteers. Next slide. So I, I do this e each time, but it's it's a really important message, especially now as there's much more talk on the, both the national and state, uh, state levels about outdoor recreation economies and a lot more talk about investing in outdoor recreation infrastructure, which is huge. So from an economic perspective, outdoor recreation, the outdoor recreation economy is 2.1% of Montana's GDP. And Montana has the third highest percentage of GDP that outdoor recreation economy contributes in the US. Next. The, third, the, the second way that outdoor recreation is cr critical is quality of life. It's the number one reasons that, that tech companies give for locating to Montana. It is an essential component, outdoor recreation access um, is an essential component of quality of life along with schools, access to broadband, scenery, clean water, um, safe streets, etc. But outdoor recreation access close to home not so far away, but close to home is essential. And finally, um, health. We have, we know this, uh, the science is coming and rolling out more and more and more. We know physical activity in nature is great. We know it's good for children. We know, all know that this is where we're meaning to, to socialize until we are all vaccinated fully and, and can get back to our normal lives. But this is what we this is how we, we meet outdoors. We meet outdoors in the outdoors. We meet, we meet in the outdoors. Uh, next. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. And Adam, if you would talk a little bit about your, your background and a little bit about these um, acronyms that are on your first slide, ATS and L ALDC, and talk also a little bit about all the hats that you wear in this, in this uh, sure. partnership. Hi. Uh, Good morning, everyone. I am Adam Bothier, as uh, Diane mentioned. Um, I am the director of the Anaconda Local Development Corporation, have been for a couple of years now. Um, that Getting to that point started a, quite some time ago, um, almost a decade ago now. I was, <clears throat> at, so at one point, um, I was on the ALDC board, um, and it was around the time that a group of Anaconda people went to, um, 
the conference about uh, outdoor recreation for the first time. And they started creating this uh, committee about healthy lifestyles and, and stuff in the community. And at the same time, ALDC was creating what was called Accelerate Anaconda, which is another grassroots group. And that was kind of my um, lead in to becoming, getting the economic development fever, as my predecessor would call it. ATS was formed out of both of those groups from seeing a need, and sorry, ATS is the Anaconda Trail Society, um, which was formed about 10 years ago. The group was formed out of a need that was in the community, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit later, about why we formed, who it is, and what we, how we do things. Um, ALDC does stand for the Anaconda Local Development Corporation, which I now work for, but had started my work with them with Accelerate Anaconda, which has become a a uh, powerful group in the community that's really focused on doing downtown and community development as we didn't have a group or uh, people in the county or anything that were working on that. Um, we've become stewards of the downtown master plan, which we've been working on for a decade now. Um, but if you haven't been to Anaconda in the past uh, 10 years, you need to drive through because the downtown looks a lot different than it did 10 years ago for sure. Um, and then, so then I became a founding member of the Trail Society as well with some other people in the community um, to do all things trails. Um, people weren't really having the conversation at that time. Um, we obviously saw how important they were and the needs that were coming forth and someone needed to start addressing those in the community. So it was really a grassroots movement to start seeing some, of, some energy put towards that. I thought first I would talk about some really successful projects that we have done, because um, who doesn't want a chance to brag about themselves a little bit. Um, so one of the key things that we've done with these first two bullets, the Hiker Hut and the CDT Gateway Community, um, we actually call it our adventure camp because we like to uh, promote it to cyclists as well as hikers. We quickly gained traction in realizing that we could get a lot more Continental Divide Trail users to stop in the community if we had these amenities for them and provided outreach to the community about who they were and why you should pick them up off the highway and why when they go in the brewery, they don't smell good, but um, they're here and they're having the experience of their life and they will spend a lot of money in our economy if we embrace them. Um, so we did do that, and we were recognized as the second CDT gateway community in Montana um, after Lincoln uh, because of the work that we're doing here. And now the Trail Society actually serves as the gateway community um, group in, in Anaconda. So we put on, we put on outreach, we uh, pay for this hiker hut, we have events for CDTers, we get locals to go out to the CDT um, to use it at a, at a, on a date day basis rather than the long term. Um, we wanted to make the community more bike friendly and pedestrian friendly, which we are still working on. It's an ongoing process because like Anaconda, most communities are, there's a highway going right down your main, as your main street, and you have to work with Department of Transportation to get anything done. Um, but we have been able to get bike racks put in. We put in sharrows on the streets. We put in some bike lanes up in the larger, uh, part where the road is larger in the community and stuff like that to create road diet. Um, and so continuous campaigns about continuing to have those amenities for bikers and uh, doing education and outreach to drivers about pedestrians and bicyclists. We actually worked with the Department of Tourism last year to do a total mapping project, which was really uh, enlightening to see how many sanctioned and unsanctioned trails exist in, in Deer Lodge County, whether they're front country, back country, um, or in town. Um, so we, we worked with them. We spent about $30,000 and hired a firm to come in and we're finishing that project, which is really cool. They, they created an app for our trail users um, for all the different groups, the Snowmobile Club, the Saddle Club, the Trail Society, the, the bicycle groups, and they all have the app and they're out, they're out riding the trails and marking whether things are right or wrong or so they're doing all the, the, the users are doing QA on that right now and then deciding which trails they want us to, to export to all of the trail apps and create maps for, for visitors that go to the visitor center. 
of course, we start we we started doing cleanup and maintenance, and so we do work with the Forest Service a lot to do Forest Service trails, CDT trails, and local trails for cleanup and maintenance. And we'll talk a lot about the maintenance projects in the future. We have been successful so far in getting easements for our, our future trails plans, um, which is sometimes the hardest part, but it has been, we've been really successful in doing that um, and finally repairing and maintaining the trails. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'm gonna focus on Anaconda's Washoe Park Trail. It is, the first of all, the Washoe Park was a remnant of the Anaconda Company and it was a gift that Marcus Daly gave to the community. The park's gone through many iterations at this point of what it looked like and what was there. At one time it had a zoo and all of these cool things um, that it's been through over time uh, when there's been larger populations and stuff. Today, the walking the Washoe Park Trail and being in the park is always a very beautiful nature experience. Um, most of the trails are completely covered with greenery and trees and all of that, and it's a beautiful experience. Um, but not until the 90s was there an actual path that walked all the way through the park. Um, and so today, um, we it, it is there and it provides a perfect opportunity for people to get out and experience uh, everything that Washoe Park has to offer and have a trail that gets them from point A to point B through the whole park. Um, it was, the trail was a huge uh, perk to, to the park and the community as it provided all of the things that we'll talk about later that trails do when they're in place and people are using them. Next slide. So this slide kind of lays out the pieces of the current uh, trail system in Anaconda. Um, the light green section there is the actual Washoe Park Trail. It's about 1.2 miles right now of, of paved asphalt trail, um, but it, it creates connectivity um, to three other large trails that are the greater trail system in the community. One of the really cool things about it is you can walk on the current trail system from each, from each end of the city limits and never have to be on a street. Um, you're constantly in, on, in nature and trees. And so it provides really great connectivity in a front country uh, nature experience. And lots of people use this trail every day. Um, we did some initial research back about 10 years ago, um, and 40% of the community said that they use this trail at least twice a month, which is pretty cool to hear. Um, and a lot, and obviously um, it provides a lot of opportunity for visitors. Um, the greater system here though is about five miles long. Um, and as you, you'll see on the next slide, it does create a lot of connectivity. Um, and so we do have a cool uh, internal um, trail system with all of those pieces that finally got put together uh, around the end, of, around the early 2000s. Next slide. So this is just a snap from a, from our our app that our trail users are are going through and writing and QAing before we put all of our trails out to the world on all the different trails apps that are out there. But as you can see, and this is just a very small snapshot of inside the community um, where Anaconda is on the map. As you can see, we have a ton of front and back country trails. Some of them are not currently sanctioned. Some of them are. Um, for example, if you're on the trail system that I'm talking about, the five miles, you certainly can connect yourself to Lost Creek State Park. Um, which connects to trails that go all the way out to Georgetown Lake on the north side of the community. And you can also certainly connect yourself on the south side to uh, Stumptown Road and take some uh, back roads and sanctioned trails to get all the way out to Georgetown Lake that direction as well. Um, and so it, it, that trail really can create, it does create access to all this backcountry, which goes way out farther than what I could put in this map off of my phone, but um, it does create all of that connectivity for people to get from front to back. Next slide. 
So this is from our master trails plan that was done quite a while ago, and it's it's maneuvered a little bit. Um, this image was part of what was going to be Trail U, which isn't going to happen anymore. Um, of course, DEQ and EPA decided that wasn't going to work. Um, but what I did want to show you is there's a dark blue trail, and then the light the bright green trails on this map, and these are going to be hugely important for our long-term goal. So right now the trails plan intention is that you can ride from Butte, Montana to Georgetown Lake and all of the pieces are in place in Deer Lodge County to do that. Um, the section that comes from Butte is just about to Anaconda. And so this bright green trail that you see on the slide is part of the Greenway trail system. And I'll talk a little bit more about the money that was behind that later, but essentially it runs the length of Silverbow Creek, which runs through Anaconda on this green section um, before it starts going into um, other bodies of water. And then what the trail society is working on, because the green part's already coming in and the construction plans are in place, and we're going to see that in the next couple of years, is the dark blue section and the trail you parts that get you from our current trail system all the way out to opportunity to connect to the greenway. Um, opportunity is a small uh, little community on uh, on the east end of Deer Lodge County. Um, and so our, our big goal one day is that we have that that sanctioned trail, whatever surfaces they are, that will run all the way from Butte to Georgetown Lake. And um, on the flip side, Phillipsburg is working on their end to get trail systems from Phillipsburg to Georgetown Lake. So it could be a pretty amazing ride one day. Next slide. So the why, why the trail is so important to the com community, obviously, is first and foremost, this access to this front country nature and trail system. Um, we all know that there's tons of benefits to everyone to experience daily nature. And I know that most of us on this call have probably been to a rec conference and had the conversations about the importance of that in everyday life. Um, but it definitely provides that opportunity. And it, from anywhere in town, you can pretty much walk to these trails um, and you're there in five minutes and then you can take a 20 minute front country experience on a daily basis and it's really can be part of your daily lifestyle without taking a lot of time. Um, connectivity is really important. Um, I've kind of shown in the past slides all of the different ways that the trails connect the front country, back country, but it also provides transportation opportunity for people who don't drive vehicles to get from one end town to the other without having to walk on the sidewalk or the street to get where they're going. Um, and it's just a much more pleasant experience. Um, and it's much more healthy for them than just walking on you know, the highway, which is two lanes of busy traffic at this point because Anaconda is a happening little town at this point. Um, next was this active lifestyle. <clears throat> and as I talked about this, we chatted and it was kind of an interesting way to look at it that we really came from a pretty polluted past. And this is part of us creating this, uh, this healthy lifestyle and healthy community and rebuilding all of the nature that was here. And we're, we're doing it in lots of ways. Um, the picture that you see is actually a really cool uh, re remediation technique. Um, that's what the golf course was. It's the largest, uh, recreational cap that EPA has ever put together uh, and Jack Nicholas built it and it's actually for EPA. Um, it's just a tool to drain water the right way so that it doesn't get polluted um, with any of the soil that's underneath the golf course. Um, the active lifestyle is hugely important. We, we know that people in the community are using it. We are, uh, as we're doing this project to resurface it. There's lots of input. You have lots of feelings about what we're doing and how we're doing it and if it's going to affect the way that they can use those trails every day. Um, the next piece was, you know, we have this, we, we have this gateway to beautiful recreation, but staying in Anaconda overnight is really one of the big goals of the, the 
tourism economy in Anaconda right now. And a big part of that is this trail system where people are looking at, am I going to stay at Fairmont or am I going to stay in Anaconda? Um, this trail system is part of the reason that people have that bigger experience when they're, when they're staying here and walking the trails. The other part of that is having visitors that are interested and always look for trails creates a more diverse group of tourists and obviously drives more diverse small businesses in the community uh, to help grow the economy. And finally, you've got the quality of life. Um, this is everything from um, our outdoor amenities, our front country, our back country, but it also relates to this trail relates to that making that quality of life in the in the front country and in the town, which brings you to the conversation about, you know, we're seeing everyone in Montana seeing it, the Anaconda is as well. You know, COVID has completely changed the landscape of our uh, housing market. Two or three years ago, any time you could have, you could have looked at the MLS and Anaconda and you would have saw 200 houses on the market any day of the week. Today, you're lucky if you see 10. Uh, five of those are a million dollars out at Georgetown Lake and the other five are probably um, not buildable or usable in Goosetown. So really there are zero houses on the market. Um, and we're seeing that throughout Montana, obviously, but our quality of life is becoming so important. And the remote worker is saying, why am I living, paying this much to live in a city and not have the amenities right at my back door like I can in Anaconda? Um, it's also the reason that the CEOs are looking at Anaconda and saying, wow, like I want to live there. I'm sure my my staff want to live there. Um, and these, this trail is part of that overall experience for them to want to live and work and play in Anaconda. Next slide. So as you may or may not know, Butte and Anaconda have a long Superfund history. Um, we've actually been um, on the national priorities list for almost 40 years now, which is crazy. Um, but over the past two and two or three years, Daryl Lodge County has made significant progress. Um, our current CEO is a, doesn't take no for an answer, I'll tell you that. And when he went in to negotiate with ARCO and EPA, um, he went to the top and the Trump administration said, we're gonna get Anaconda and Butte off of this list by 2025. And he said, EPA, you need to figure it out and you need to make it happen. And it is starting to happen and we can't wait for that day. Um, we can't wait to get the Superfund st stigma off of the internet when the first thing you search Anaconda comes up is that. Um, but there were some silver linings of Superfund. Um, first and foremost, the, the sections of Washoe Park Trail that I showed that are that bigger part, not in the actual park, um, are all funded, was all funded with Superfund money. Um, the picture in front of you is what we call the Red Sands. And it's a beautiful walk uh, down on the east side of the Old Brooks Golf Course. Um, that trail then runs all the way out to Galen Highway and connects back to the, the, uh, to the golf course and the Washoe Park trails. And then there's actually a trail that goes up around the golf course um, for people to walk as well. And then on the, on the west side of the, the park, they, we used NRD funds, which are also super fun related to build the trail from Washoe Park all the way up to Hefner's Dam, which connects you where we plan on running a sanction trail all the way out to Georgetown Lake. Right now you can hit trails then that are more backcountry or non-sanctioned to get there, but we're working on that on that end. And so these trails were well planned and they're, they're in great shape. And I think they will stay that way long into the future. Um, but yeah, it was one of the, the pluses of, of Superfund. And the Greenway Trail that's coming from Butte is also uh, Superfund money um, that was specifically put together to clean up Silverboat Creek and build that amenity uh, along the whole thing. Next slide. So <clears throat> this is what parts of the Washoe Park Trail look like today. Um, there's a lot going on here. Um, obviously, this is the project that we're working on right now and we're, we're really working to figure out how or when we're going to get this, we are going to get it done this summer. Um, we've got a lot going on with it, but this was the 90s when someone said, let's put a trail in Marshall Park. And everyone said, good idea. And 
the parks department just went out and paved a six foot wide trail all the way through Washoe Park, wherever they could fit it, which is great. Um, we had we had a trail, um, and people loved it. And they and like I said, they absolutely use it, and it does have a lot of perks. Where we're at with it though is you see a lot of this on the on the path. Um, a lot of planning wasn't taken into consideration. There there was no planning. There's actually no base under this asphalt right now. Um, it's just laid over dirt, um, which is why you can see all the cracking and uh, the breaking of the asphalt. And then there was poor planning where places where the water is consistently over the trail or frozen and becomes an issue. Um, so great that we had a trail, but now in 2021, we're facing the issue of exactly how we're gonna fix the trail. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, so I said a, a little bit before, like I would, would talk about what, how Trail Society came to be. So uh, between the mountain bikers and the hikers, we really formed a grassroots group. Um, we're focused on building partnerships. We obviously saw that there was a huge need for maintenance of trails in the community from cleaning them to uh, uh, resurfacing them to just patching them and things like that. Obviously we're doing lots of championing and planning. So we kind of started building these partnerships to get projects done uh, when, in around 2007. So we've been working with the Community Foundation ever since um, and Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And the first thing that we did with the Washoe Park Trails was we obviously needed to put a plan together for how we were going to resurface the trail. And so the first thing we did with the foundation is they became our fiscal sponsor, uh, which means that they handle all of our finances. Uh, they handle everything that goes along with that. Um, we just pr provide them with whatever invoices we need paid. But from there on, the group pretty much relies on them to do all of the, 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 the financial part. And they are a 501c3, so people can receive tax deductions for their donations. Next, we went and got a planning. We went to we went to uh, Fish Valley and Parks and got a grant to do kind of our pilot with the Washoe Park Trail, which this trail society currently wouldn't have been able to do without the foundation. Um, we didn't have thirty thousand dollars sitting in the bank to front the cost of this project uh, until we could get reimbursed from the state of Montana. So the foundation provided us the upfront funds to do the project and then get reimbursed from um, the money that we did have and from fish wildlife and parks we also worked with them to do our trails mapping project which i talked about earlier to get all of our trails mapped and have them available for tourists and visitors next slide so today this doesn't look like much on the screen but this is thirty thousand dollars later um, of planning <laughs> um, and permitting, which always costs a lot of money. Um, so what we did with the planning process was uh, look at surface. Obviously, we're going to move away from an asphalt surface to a compressed gravel surface throughout the park. Um, and then we did a lot of rerouting and we did a lot of ADA planning, which none of that was ever done before. And then we talked about how we were going to put the trail bed in. One of the big things that was missing all along is there are sections of the trail that are absolutely non-ADA compliant. And then as you saw in the previous slides, the, the trail is starting to crack up and break. So we kind of have a budding relationship with the county. They've never really wanted to work on trails, um, but I kind of sat down with the, the CEO and I said, I kind of gave him a stick approach to what we needed. And I said, this is your trail, it's your property and it's, huge liability right now from an ADA perspective and from just the safety of an everyday walker. And so me and you need to figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to fix this. So it, thank God that worked. Um, and so the county did pitch in about $65,000 for the trail resurfacing. The trail society is pitching in $60,000. Um, and then obviously, probably like most people, most towns, we have applications into RTP and the trail stewardship program. So we're waiting to hear back on those at the end of the month, which will decide if we do this whole uh, design or if we do two thirds of it. Either way, we're, we're gonna be 120,000 in this summer. If we get the grants, we're gonna be 220,000 in this summer, which is a whole lot of money to resurface a trail. 
Um, and it, and I, I obviously I can't say for sure whether or not, but I imagine if it would have been done right in the first place, it probably would have been a lot cheaper than what we're doing today because a big portion of that cost is removing what's there so that we can put in the proper base. Um, the other thing that was very interesting about just digging in and pouring asphalt is trails aren't built six feet wide. Um, they're generally built at least eight feet wide. And so, um, you know, we had to make that major adjustment too, which was very expensive when it comes to permitting because this trail runs right along the creek. So you've got all the agencies involved in order to get the correct permits to put the trail there. Um, so that was a big, that's obviously a big lesson for today, obviously, is, you know, in the long run, getting spending at $30,000 seems like a lot of money. Um, but in the long run, I think it saves a lot of money when you don't have to completely remove and reconstruct the trail. Next slide. So currently, these are the partnerships that are really making this work for the Trail Society um, and to redo this portion in Washoe Park um, and keep us moving forward on maintaining all of these beautiful trails and making all of these sanctioned connections to our back country. So we couldn't, definitely couldn't be where we are without the foundation. Um, ALDC obviously provides a lot of assistance to the Trail Society. Um, my staff spends a lot of time working with Trail Society projects. Um, we're excited to finally start building this relationship with the county and how we're gonna go into this in perpetuity about maintenance and uh, use. Um, our CEO is really excited because he's, ATS and him are teaming up to make part of the trail and the golf course trails cross country ski use it use in the winter time, which he's really excited about. Um, and of course, we keep working with the Forest Service to clean up trails and Fish Wildlife Parks continues to send us grant money. So we always have to be thankful for that. And then I think Glory is up. Um, next slide. So I'm going to turn it over um, to Gloria. And like I said, Adam, that was fantastic. I, I always learn a little something new um, each time we go through this. And I cannot wait to come and check out the trails. Um, the, the partnership between um, the Trail Society and the, you know, from the local development perspective with the Anaconda Community Foundation is just really remarkable. And I asked Gloria to talk a little bit about Anaconda Community Foundations, but also community foundations across the, the state, because I think they're a little bit of an underutilized or underappreciated um, relationship with with that that engages local donors with local projects in a way that is a little bit more hands-on than a lot of what we might think of in terms of a, of a foundation uh, as a tax structure or a, a nonprofit type of entity. So with that, Gloria, if you will tell, talk a little bit about yourself and your hats and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Adam mentioned the year 2007 um, as uh, when uh, the Trail Society really got coordinated and that was the year that the Anaconda Community Foundation was formed. I happened to go to a conference wearing my economic developer's hat and uh, learned that a key pillar to a community success is to have a foundation. So I came home and, and said to um, Jim Davison, who was in Adam's position, we need to have a community foundation. And it just so happened, Bob and Joan Morris, who were very active with the San Diego Community Foundation said, Jim, we need to start a foundation in Anaconda. And so things just beautifully came together. And you can see our mission statement. Um, our purpose is to build a permanent financial legacy for Anaconda using our generous citizens and friends. Um, and our purpose is to develop and maintain a thriving community forever. We're in this for the long haul. Next slide. 
And so I, I, I don't know if any of you have even have thought of a foundation, um, but just as Diane mentioned, I, my purpose today is to get you to think about and be aware of a foundation that might be near you. So um, what do foundations do? Well, it really depends on um, the structure of that foundation. We happen to be a community foundation, which operates different from a private foundation or a family-focused foundation or um, a, a, a trust-like foundation. So um, that's key to first figure out, you know, what kind of foundation is near you. And doing a little research um, will help you find the right match, just as I bet some of you watching today have done grant applications. Well, be you don't, you know, just apply for a grant. You research who, who would be a good fit. Well, you need to do the same with your community, with your foundation. And just real briefly, I get this asked a lot. What's the difference between United Way and a foundation? And just as United Ways are all different as foundations, um, so take this as an, a broad explanation. But I like to think of United Way as more as a checkbook function. You know, they, uh, they will raise the money, they'll have um, uh, nonprofits already prepared that they're raising the money for, and then choose the checks and the cycle starts all over again. Um, foundations are more, long term. We do do some of what the United Way does on that short end, um, but we also have the endowment process, the donor advised fund process, so that we have a long term financial future in the works. And so um, another important thing foundations do is they bring various players together, just like you've heard on this call today. What, what foundation gets involved with um, trails or uh, caring about um, if a biker coming through town has a place to stay? Well, um, a foundation is a great entity to bring groups together. And finally, um, foundations address issues. If we're really doing our jobs as a foundation, we are listening and hearing to what our community needs and we go to work on um, addressing those needs. So the you and you and you slide, it's all about our donors, um, that we listen to them and try to help them meet those needs of our community. Next slide. This is an awesome, awesome map. It, you can find it. The website is on the bottom of the slide. It's from the Montana Community Foundation. And so those of you that are watching, feel free to go to this website and click on one of those little red dots and you can find um, and research easily a foundation that might be a good partner for you. Next slide. So as a, again, emphasis on community foundation, we serve a specific geographical area. For example, if someone from Kalispell wanted us to provide money for the dragon race on Flathead Lake, which is super cool, we would have to say, no, we're sorry. We can only uh, support nonprofits and projects in our geographical area. Um, also, as a community foundation, we are engaged. Um, we need to know what's going on in our community. What are our needs? What, what are we doing right? What do we need help with? Um, we are also great if we're doing our job at spreading the word to our donors. I long ago got over the fear of asking someone for money because I've learned that when you ask, the person can say yes or they can say no. And if they say yes, um, they feel better. They feel good. They feel like, ah, I'm so glad I can contribute. And so I'm not afraid to ask anymore because if I can help someone feel good about giving to an important cause, then I'm willing to ask. If they say no, that's okay too. Um, another um, task we do is we provide grant cycles to fund programs. Um, we happen to have two, one in the spring and one in the fall. And usually that is limited to about 6,000 each round. Um, and so sometimes what happens is projects like Adams are way 
bigger than those grant cycles. And so uh, in another slide, I'll, I'll share how we handle those, but we do have typical grant cycles. Another thing our foundation does is we invest funds because we're all about our future. And then we provide a place for legacy donors. Um, if I had more time, I would tell you this wonderful story about Charles Hare, the guy who walked around town with his funny little Palmerinian dog. He always wore a fishing hat. And Charles Hare left us a legacy of over $300,000. So we were the place for him to be able to um, leave a legacy in the community that he loved. Next slide. So funding flexibility for us as a community foundation is critical. Um, you know, a, a typical foundation will have endowments and that means you can only touch the interest of the money learned. You can't, you can't touch the, the core funds. Donor advised funds, that's when a donor says, oh, I'm going to give you these funds only for the trail. Um, unrestricted, oh, we love those. They'll say, use this for the most need or field of interest where I want this to only go for healthcare. So um, while those are all great, they're still limited, right? Um, so let me skip down to the real great flexibility ACF has, and that is the Betterment Fund. Uh, Adam knows this fund well. Um, it is the one that we go to when the typical grant ask is bigger than we can typically provide. And so we have a special fund set aside with our investors, who's Cleland and Company, thanks to our founder, Bob Morris, with that connection. And you can see on the slide, we've divided it into grants, business loans, community projects, economic development, marketing, and community events. How wonderful that we've been able to set up a, a fund that we have the flexibility so that when someone like Adam comes to us, we can say, hmm, I think we have a way we can work together. Next slide. So Adam did mention this uh, relationship we have in it with Anaconda Trails, and it is legally known as a fiscal sponsor. And so that means, as Adam mentioned, any donation that is given outright becomes a tax deduction. Without that, they, their donors, you know, are just giving. But as a fiscal sponsor, we can, since they're using our 501c3, provide those. Um, I think most of that Adam covered. We do take a, a admin fee of 5% at the end of the year. Whatever is in their account, December 31st, we take 5% of that to pay for the expenses we incurred over the year. So next slide. So in case some of you listening and watching are thinking, hmm, I want to approach my foundation and see if they're willing to help. Here's just a couple of tips to help you share and remind them what's in it for your foundation. Um, remember the typical foundation, we need publicity just like you all. Our publicity is how we get donors. And so when Adam puts out, say, um, an event for Anaconda Trail Society, as the fiscal sponsor, it needs to say on there, fiscal sponsor, all checks made out to Anaconda Community Foundation. This, this provides us with more networking and um, more avenues for donors. Um, it also, you could tell this foundation, hey, we want you to get involved with our project because it will deepen your knowledge of community needs. needs. Come be with us, invest in this project and uh, literally walk with us, which I have walked that trail with Adam and Lydia and his team and really get a firsthand look at what our community needs. Um, and you can see the other bullets there. Um, just really engaging with the community is critical and engaging with those doing the work in your community are critical. And so next slide. So we're back to where we started. Uh, I'd like to just I'd like to just put a big bow on all of this and show you that um, working together 
as the foundation and being a partner with Anaconda Local Development Accelerate Anaconda, it has helped us to build a financial legacy for Anaconda um, because we're developing and maintaining relationships that help us have that thriving community forever. That's, that's it. Well, thank you. Um, so you can see uh, the, you know, the relationships that we have uh, and um, the depth and the innovation that small communities can take the resources that they have and bundle them together and use them in ways that um, really are win-win wins. Win for the community, win for the community foundation, and win for the nonprofit that is the, the champion and the engine frequently behind these um, front country trail projects and trail projects in general. Uh, I'm gonna go through a few um, what's up next share the contact information for Gloria and Adam. And if we have a little time, I'm gonna go through the questions. I see one question that's gonna be a super quick, but um, I did wanna have maybe um, Adam talk a little bit about um, the grant process, how you go through the grant process in your relationship, local government, nonprofit, and the community foundation. Who's, who's the applicant? So um, first of all, um, Mark your calendar. We have the uh, front country. I, Bob Walker, for those of you who know Bob Walker, you'll know that he's a force of nature and keeper of all knowledge of uh, outdoor, re outdoor recreation legislation. And again, we focus mainly on parks and trails and, and recreation access, less on habitat, because a lot of other groups are, are following that and um, publicizing that, but parks and trails, uh, slip through the cracks sometimes. So we're, that's what we do. Um, we've done it every other, uh, every other Thursday. The next ones are April 15th, uh, this coming Thursday and April 29th. And if you care about funding for parks and trails and you wanna know what's going on, because I am telling you it is fast, furious, hot, changes by the day, um, having someone of Bob's caliber be able to, to walk through which bills are the important ones to watch and what the status is, is well worth it. Uh, our next webinar coming up is um, May 11th, and I think we'll do a dedicated session to legislative changes around outdoor recreation, parks, trails, and recreation access. Um, once the dust settles, uh, particularly with available funding and potentially new funding sources, both for parks, new parks, we have two in the hopper. One is on um, the north end of Flathead Lake, uh, Summers Beach access, and one is an amazing uh, river trail and river amenity in the lower Yellowstone. Uh, I think those that funding is still looking to come through, but we also have the... Um, Led, um, recreational marijuana tax money that is uh, to be allocated by the legislature and we'll, we'll, we'll just see that could potentially provide an additional funding source. Um, June 8th, uh, I call it e-bikes are a coming. Uh, there were a lot of legislation this year and there's, it's a very hot topic both locally and nationally, particularly around e-bikes and on natural surface trails and mountain bike trails. Um, so it's really that space between e-bikes and human, fully human powered um, mountain bikes um, that are either co conflict or opportunity, but, um, but e-bikes are very popular and they are it, there's a lot of talk around it. So we'll do that on June 8th. Next slide. Um, this, this slide, this contact information will be available. Uh, you can download this presentation when we're finished. You can also download the video portion as well that will be available on the Montana Access website and um, check back for, it usually takes us a couple days to get back in, but if there's some, something that you missed or so, something, something that you want to share with others, uh, feel free to do that. Um, uh, finally, we keep 
we have a little bit more current information happening on Facebook. We have a Montana Access Project website. And we also have a Facebook page for Front Country Recreation Alliance. And it's a way for Front Country champions, users, land managers to uh, create a network with each other, peer-to-peer -peer network, you know, in these days where we can't get together and go to the Recreation Trails Conference conferences anymore. Uh, it's just a way to sort of chit chat about who's who's doing what, where, and keeping up with with uh, what's happening. And there's a lot happening in terms of uh, infrastructure, active transportation, roads, bridges, trails, parks at the state and federal level. It's really a changing environment. Um, next slide. Okay, that's it. Um, so we have, um, how many minutes? So we have four minutes. Um, Adam, can you talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned FWP grants. Can you be a little bit more specific? Which types of grant programs are you going for? And who's the applicant when you have these complex relationships? Sure. So with the, with the projects we've been doing in Washoe Park, um, obviously there's a lot of collaboration that has to take place before you apply, but we, the, the grant we previously did with the foundation was a recreational trails program through Fish, Wild, and Parks, which are due annually, roughly around February. Um, but generally speaking, um, with us, the foundation, because they do all of the finances, is the actual applicant to Fish, Wild, and Parks for the money. Um, the Trail Society in the county, obviously, we had them signed on. They had letters of support and letters of financial support and what they were committing to the projects beforehand and so that everything was good to go with um, the commission and the CEO and all of that beforehand. So everyone was collaborating. And then uh, the application was finally submitted by Gloria to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um Gloria, was that an issue for your community foundation? Was there an education process or reluctance to do that? I, no, I, Adam promised me that um, this would not be a burden on the foundation. <laughs> and I really, when it did go very, very well, um, when something came up that I needed help with, I, I knew I could tap Adam, Lydia, Tia, um, to help with it. Uh, I did not have to learn the mechanics of the grant itself. Um, Adam himself did all of that. Um, Mike, our, our, our bookkeeper, um, was able to manage the funds just fine. So it, it really worked well. There was a little bit of learning curve on my part, but Adam's just down the hall. Let's see, we do have one question in the Q&A and Adam, this is for uh, probably for you. Corey Beatty would like to get involved with the trail mapping project and app and would like to get started. So um, I think maybe so, you can give yeah, me- if anyone's, Yeah, if anyone's interested in more information about how we did the trail mapping project or if anyone from Anaconda is interested in being involved, certainly um, send me an email or you can send Tia an email. It's the same as mine, but it's tiaanacondadevelopment.org. Um, and we'll get you the, um, there's a whole manual on how to go in and uh, QA the trails. And we'd love to have anyone who's interested to participate in that. Um, one thing I did want to mention it, that I forgot when I was talking about diversifying businesses through trails. Um, so in Anaconda right now, because of the CDT and the trails and the cyclists that are coming through because of this work, um, there is a new business opening and there's going to be a hostel that, that focuses mostly on these visitors to the community and providing them, the ones that are interested, a, a super affordable place to stay while they're here. Well, that's exciting. I know that with our Whitefish Trail also, it, it serves as an anchor for a business which is the whitefish bike retreat so it's a mountain bike focused bike retreat um and uh it's a it's it's great it's great that these businesses like this can leverage our outdoor recreation infrastructure and uh 
create jobs and provide an amazing uh, experience for folks. Um, with that, we are out of time. Um, check back again, Montana Access Project um, website and Facebook page for more current information. Uh, check in with us on the 15th. It should be interesting to hear from Bob Walker. And um, thank you so much. I'm going to sign off. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>